War Socialism and William James. Quote, History is a bath of blood. Unquote. William James tells us, and there is much truth to that. William James was a leading American philosopher at the turn of the 20th century, typically categorized as a pragmatist. Pragmatism is a philosophical uh, emphasis on workability and practicality, distrust and distaste for abstract ivory tower speculation and the general reputation philosophy has for uselessness. My lecture on pragmatic philosophy and its implications for education is available for free online at YouTube and a couple of other places, a part of my philosophy of education series. I'll put the uh, links in the, the notes uh, when they're published. But today I want to focus on an essay written by William James uh, called The Moral Equivalent of War. It was originally given as a lecture at Stanford University in 1906, and it was later published. Uh, William James in it describes himself as a socialist, describes himself as a pacifist, and is very disgusted with the human history of war and is very much looking for a solution to it. And I want to uh, indicate my general disagreement with probably 80% of uh, what James stands for philosophically. But this essay in particular, while uh, thoughtful uh, and, and well argued with, in its premises, is uh, to my mind highly objectionable. So I'll indicate some criticisms of it a little at the end. So what is the solution to war? And uh, James goes on to argue that first we have to really understand war's history and the importance of war to human experience. So he recounts a long history of just bloody wars. Uh, goes back to the Trojan War and the Iliad, all of the Greek city-states uh, ganging up on the Trojans and uh, a huge bloodbath for some years there. But it's celebrated by the poets uh, down through the centuries and now a classic. The Peloponnesian War, largely recounted to us by Thucydides, but then the two allegedly you know, civilized states, leading states of the Greek experience, Athens and Sparta, going at it for decades, the Spartans eventually winning, but a power play by both of them, and both of them uh, willing to uh, spill a whole lot of blood and just exert their their dominance whenever necessary. Alexander the Great, a couple of generations later, an orgy of conquest by a young man who uh, imposes his will upon the world, and we honor him again throughout the centuries by the honorific the Great, and history books invariably account for his exploits in heroic terms. Then the Romans uh, conquering most of the known world, uh, the known world, and so forth. So. Interestingly, uh, James is disgusted by all of this, but he goes on to make a point that this has left its mark on us, not just socially, but biologically. War is now bred into us. William James is a second generation of evolutionists. The Origin of Species, published in 1859, of course, evolutionary ideas were all over the place. In the 19th century, what Darwin is doing is providing the uh, account that's going to carry the day among biologists. Uh, it'll be, of course, supplemented by Mendelian genetics a generation later. But William James is part of the generation that is taking seriously evolutionary thinking and its implications for it. And what James wants to draw from the history is that uh, we are uh, part of evolutionary history and evolutionary works, or evolution works rather by basically breeding into us traits that have been enabling us to survive. So, particularly in males, pugnacity, the desire for plunder, for glory, for enjoying the spilling of blood, for mixing it up, that quick to flame aggressiveness and to, uh, to initiate and respond very quickly to conflict in physicalistic forms, James believes that is now part of the human biological inheritance. Now, the story of females is, uh, is slightly different. Of course, they are also instinctually creatures and have been bred, but they're not quite in the same way that males have. 
But James then uh, jumps to contemporary times, uh, and it's just more war, war, war. Interestingly, James does not mention entirely in his essay, or at all, the U.S. Civil War, which had been a you know, just a generation before his adulthood, but he does mention the Boer War in Africa. He mentions the Spanish-American War of 1898 under President McKinley, who then came to be assassinated. And his point is that the history of the world continues. Now, he does say that, you know, as we get into the 20th century, there is some sense that peace matters more to us now than historically, and that maybe we start to believe that reactive wars are maybe more defensive wars are legitimate, but uh, James goes on to claim that that's just a weak force within us and mostly it's a sham for hypocrisy. It's just a, it's a cover story. We have maybe some feelings of guilt about our bloodthirstiness and warlikeness, but really the, uh, the sham gets exposed pretty easily. And he has this interesting cynical remark, quote, every up-to-date dictionary should say that peace and war mean the same thing. Unquote. So at this point in human biological history, we can't overcome the lust for war and the strong desire for its glories and its bounties. So what should we do about that? Now, James is a pacifist, but at the same time, he recognizes that pacifist arguments are, at least up to his time, pretty weak. And he says, quote, I believe that the difficulty is due to certain deficiencies in the program of pacifism, unquote. Pacifism up to his generation is just too much imaginary utopianism. Wouldn't it be nice if we could all just get along with each other and put war behind us? It's too sentimentalist. It's too, ooh, yuck, war is ugly and brutal. And James goes on to argue, yes, uh, has made zero impact on the warlikeness of human beings because uh, it seems that the militarists have a much better understanding of human nature and even the moral high ground in many respects because they will just simply respond, well, sure, yeah. You know, all these uh, ugly and brutal things that you say, you pacifists say, are in war. Yes, of course, war is ugly and brutal, but... War is also noble, and it can bring the best out in us. It genders our spirits of patriotism. It encourages manly virtue. Uh, some militarists will even argue that war is a divine calling. So they can just simply dismiss the pacifist as kind of weak-willed, emotionalist, scaredy-cats, uh, kind, of, kind of closet cowards, and so forth. And so really the debate then between the pacifists and those who uh, are in favor of war uh, just degenerates into name calling. The, uh, the pacifists will call the, the military types animals and brutes, and the military response is just to say, oh, you're all just a bunch of uh, pansies and uh, semi-cowards. So what James wants to argue, and uh, this is the most interesting part of his argument, is that pacifists need to have a better solution. What he wants to do first is to acknowledge that there is such a thing as a higher case for war and militarism. That, that is a genuine appeal to the human condition and that there are genuine military virtues, high military virtues that so far only war has brought out in human beings. And he does sympathetically su summarize uh, one of the leading militarists, uh, as he calls him of the time, a General Homer Lee. And this is uh, a longish quote from James summarizing Lee's position. Quote, it is obvious that the United States of America, as they exist today, impress a mind like General Lee's as so much human blubber. Uh, pause the quote there for a moment. That's a beautiful phrase, human blubber. Right? So human beings in the United States, uh, as they are becoming, the United States getting as a commercial republic, is becoming prosperous, successful, and so forth. But humans are becoming physically soft. They're becoming mentally passive. They're becoming kind of ambitious-less. They uh, have this kind of slack morality that seems to be prevailing culturally. So we can imagine now in 21st century times, in our own times, right, all those you know 20-somethings who are still you know, living at home, they're slouching on their mom's sofas while they're playing video games unendingly, eating potato chips and just basically getting fat. They don't have any direction in their lives and they're kind of only semi-human beings. That's human blubber indeed.
And William James then continues this sympathetic portrayal, quote, where is the sharpness, the, the precipitousness, the contempt for life, whether one's own or another's? Where is the savage yes and no, the unconditional duty? Where is the conscription? Where is the blood tax? Where is anything that one feels honored to be by belonging to, unquote? Or to take another animal right, example, now we human beings have predatory instincts. Right? We've clawed our way to the top of the food chain. So James and others can ask us to imagine you no know, other predatory animals. We share a biological history with them. So imagine, you know, lions, wolves, eagles, and so forth. What is the best life, really, for biologically a predatory animal? And now think of a lion in a zoo, right? It doesn't have to hunt. Right? Its food is brought to it. Water is always available to it, never has to go thirsty. The females are always there equally with nothing to do, you know, they're totally looked after. But that's no life for a lion. Right? It should be out there in the wild, hunting its prey, fighting for dominance within the pride, once in a while kicking some hyena ass, living on the edge. That's what it is to be genuinely engaged with lion lifestyle. And the same thing holds for human beings, right? Commercialism, and even the kind of pacifism that is often advocated, that just breeds softness, right? Femininity, decadence, it's pathetic. Along the way, James notes a contemporary, this is now very early 1900s, Japanese attitude toward the United States, which uh, parenthetically parallels a German attitude toward Britain. Remember, this is now uh, only a decade or less before World War I is to break out. Yeah, the idea that Britain and the United States, they're these commercial democracies, they're all into trade and so forth, they're getting rich, but they're also getting soft, they're getting fat. And those of us who are Japanese and by, uh, by a parallel German, much more militaristic, much more with a sense of patriotic duty, we can conquer them relatively easy. Those people are only semi-manly, and they're not going to be any, any, uh, any match for us. So what James wants to conclude so far in his argument is, is, yes, war is awful, but it is also awesome. And so far in human history, it has been necessary. And here's a quotation, again, a sympathetic quotation from William James about the militaristic position. Quote, its dread hammer is the welder of men into cohesive states, and nowhere but in such states can human nature adequately develop its capacity. The only alternative is degeneration, unquote. So... James is agreeing in part with the militarists, right? that the militarists have a better understanding of what human beings need. Of course, we might argue uh, against that to say, look, you know, maybe if war bred pugnacity and bloodlust into us, and they're now part of our instinctual makeup, well, why can't peace just breed it out of us? Why not uh, perhaps with some sort of accelerated selective breeding program for humans, just as we do with dogs or farm animals? We can change our instincts and breed a better, more peaceful kind of human being. Now, James is not a eugenicist, that is like the growing popularity of those ideas in many intellectual circles in his time. He believes we are not going to change human nature. Quote, our ancestors have bred pugnacity into our bone and marrow, and thousands of years of peace won't breed it out of us." Unquote. So the warlike instincts are bred into us, so we're going to need more than some sort of emotionalist response of fear and revulsion to the war and the warlikeness that, that, uh, that we have experienced. War is an evil, he believes that, but it is in fact, the romance of history, and it is satisfying an actual human need. We also need more than some sort of uh, otherworldly consolation response that, yes, this is a world of veil and tears and violence and, and lions and, and predatory instincts and so forth. But in the afterlife, the lion will lie down with the lamb and there will be everlasting peace among all of us. He mentions Tolstoy's program of pacifism, and James has no truck with any of that. 
We also, he thinks, needs a more manly socialistic response. James counts himself among the socialists, but he notes uh, rather contemptuously that much socialist rhetoric of the time seems rather pathetic and demeaning to human beings. What do socialists want? And it seems like they're almost excuse, exclusively, rather, gripped by these desires for material comfort. What do they want? They want shorter working hours. They want nicer working conditions. They want more money for food and drink and the comforts of home. They want earlier retirement. That is to say, what are the socialists projecting? They want this life of ease and relaxation, and that's their ideal. And that, too, can only appear less than human. Again, that's like just human blubber is what the goal is to those who are more fully engaged with their human instincts and their energies and their ambitions and their willingness to go out into the world and really mix it up. The martial virtues, William James says, quote, are absolute and permanent human goods. So otherworldly pacifism, sentimentalist, peace-loving, socialism that just amounts to uh, you know, a comfortable life with enough to eat and, uh, and a nice sofa to sit on, that is not a legitimate aspiration for humanity. But can we then find a substitute for war, an activity that will in fact engage all of our instincts, we need to satisfy our instincts, but in a way that is going to fit with James's own understanding of what a utopian world will be, one that fits his moral vision, but nonetheless is realistic about the war-bred instincts of human nature. So here's a quote about his own utopia. Quote, I devoutly believe in the reign of peace and in the gradual advent of some sort of socialist equilibrium. Unquote. So what we need to do then is find a, quote, moral equivalent to war, right? something that will be equivalent to war in satisfying our human instincts, but it will be a moral pursuit rather than war's immoral pursuit. And moral here means satisfying pacifistic and socialistic uh, ideals. And James's answer to that question is yes. What we should do is take the traditional military methods. We draft human beings by conscription. We put them into an army under unconditional obedience hierarchy, and we direct all of those human energies toward a national cause. So we're going to have armies, drafts, and national causes, but we are going to redirect those toward productive purposes in agriculture and in industry. Quote, this is my idea. This is William James speaking now. Quote, this is my idea. There were, instead of military conscription, a conscription of the whole youthful population to form for a certain number of years a part of the army enlisted against nature. Unquote. So what James is then suggesting is that we take all of our young people and we uh, have a mandatory conscription for some years. We'll put them to work at all of the jobs that society deems necessary. Road building, dishwashing, working in foundries and mines, fishing fleets, clothes washing, and so forth. And James argues that these programs will have certain virtues, right? One of the important virtues, of course, will be that everybody will be working toward a collective purpose. There will be compulsory discipline and sacrifice it's all going to be government run. And of course, this is a peaceful set of projects that are being engaged in. So like the military, it's a collective purpose. It has government discipline and sacrifice, or sorry, compulsory discipline and sacrifice. It is all government run, but it's not martial. It's peaceful. So on the collectivity and why James thinks that's moral, quote, notice this very strong statement, quote, all the qualities of a man acquire dignity when he knows that the service of the collectivity that owns him needs him, unquote. So note that moral principle. Sacrifice and discipline as moral. We must, as a matter of moral principle, quote, preserve some of the old elements of army discipline, unquote. Army discipline, of course, we know hierarchical, absolute obedience, 
great power over individuals to form them into whatever the hierarchy in the army deems necessary. And that it is government run, that also is a moral political principle for William James, quote, this is my idea, if there were instead of military conscription, a conscription right, of the whole youthful population, et cetera, et cetera, an army, unquote. So notice, governments will conscript the whole of the youthful population of the society will be at the disposal of the government. The government will be deciding what projects need to be fulfilled. And that is the socialism taken to be the moral ideal. So on James's account, we can get it all here, right? Our evolved instincts are going to be satisfied. Uh, the socialism is going to be satisfied. The pacifism will be satisfied. And at the same time, young people will, quote, get the childishness knocked out of them, unquote. Through their work, quote, they will have paid their blood tax, unquote. And they will become better, more moral human beings. All right, this is a summary of the uh, moral equivalent of war, James's 1906 article with some supporting quotations. And uh, I now want to launch some criticisms because I find this uh, to be a rather uh, morally repulsive article uh, written by a philosopher, a rather influential philosopher. And I'm also struck by the fact that James is a, an American philosopher, but my idea of what it is to be an American philosopher is very much not William James. So here's a few things. I suppose we say, for example, that we want to have uh, human activities that are going to bring out the best in us, that have us a sense of high mission, uh, require discipline, a willingness to you know, uh, bear pain and privation in the short term in order to achieve our goals, that are going to teach us to get along with other human beings and work with them sometimes for cooperative purposes and so forth. James seems to present to us only two alternatives, right? One, of course, is the traditional one of war, and the other is his suggestion of uh, government-run conscription programs. But uh, why not, for example, sports? Right? Uh, he doesn't discuss sports at all, but sports does seem to be an obvious alternative as something that uh, you know, involves teamwork, it involves dedication, it involves discipline, and it involves some sense of high aspiration and accomplishment. And we do know that uh, people, when they're fans or even participants, uh, seem to be a fully realized human beings. So if we're looking for a substitute for war, why does William James, as an obviously highly intelligent guy, not even mention sports, uh, if not to dismiss it? What about religion as an alternative? James in other essays uh, speaks about religion, but religion does not get a mention here. Well, religion, we know, can also be an individual pursuit. It can be a, uh, a cooperative pursuit. It does seem to have the capacity for marshalling all sorts of human energies and, uh, and, and portraying high human aspiration, discipline, self-sacrifice, higher purposes, and so forth. So many of the buttons that James wants to be pushing does seem to be possibly satisfiable by religion. But again, the issue is not whether it would work, but he doesn't even mention it, if only to dismiss it. Or why not entrepreneurship, having human beings with an aspiration of creating their own businesses and creating perhaps larger scale business enterprises, those too can involve a great deal of uh, enterprise, uh, discipline, uh, a willing to forego comforts in the short run, the imperative of learning to work with other people, and so on. But again, not even mentioned. So these alternatives that uh, are just omitted strike me as odd. Second, this quotation that James leads early on with, uh, history is a bath of blood. Strikes me this is both an overstatement and uh, a large amount of uh, omissionizing, if I can make up a word there. History is a bath of blood. Why is history not also a lot of art and architecture and amazing industrial achievements, uh, both in the creation of 
uh, business enterprises and in engineering and the Industrial Revolution, the saga of entrepreneurship in the 19th century, the great uh, history of the end of slavery and the expansion of women's liberties, the fact uh, that religious oppression has declined significantly and religious toleration is on the upswing. Are those not part of history? To reduce history to a bath of blood does seem to be rather omitting of a large part of human history. It's also uh, striking to me that there's no sense uh, from James's early 21st century that the war that has, of course, been a huge part of human history seems to be declining as the 18th and 19th centuries have gone on. Perhaps this is forgivable. James is much closer to the time. He doesn't have the uh, social science data that we now have access to. But it is important to note that the capitalist peace thesis, the idea that people who trade with each other, nations that start to trade with each other, they start to see each other as customers and vendors. And you don't want to go to war because then, uh, you know, obviously you lose a lot of money because you can't do business with your customers and vendors in other countries. And also the, the liberal and democratic peace Theses. Uh, they were out there in the 19th century, the idea that human beings have rights to liberty and property rights, and we should respect that, and we should be trying to extend human rights uh, across the world rather than just conquering people and taking their stuff. Those were uh, prominent theses in the 19th century. John Stuart Mill and Cobden. Uh, earlier, even Friedrich Engels and Immanuel Kant had recognized the capitalist and liberal theses, theses rather, even though they uh, kind of disliked them and had misgivings about them. But James does not uh, discuss them. I mean, he mentions in passing, right, that trade does seem to be a countervailing force to our pugnacious, pugnacious instincts. But he uh, just kind of dismisses it uh, just in, uh, in one, one sentence. He just says, uh, after mentioning trade in passing, quote, showing wars, irrationality, and horrors is of no effect upon him, unquote. Him being uh, even the modern business person. Picking up the quotation again, the horrors make the fascination. War is the strong life. It is the life in extremis. War taxes are the only one that men never hesitate to pay. Unquote. So the capitalist peace thesis uh, or, or the liberal democratic thesis uh, doesn't even get a, a paragraph uh, from William James. And that strikes me as, a, as an important omission. A uh, more serious criticism to me is William James, early 20th century thinker, stating explicitly that human beings should be owned and that favoring explicitly a kind of slavery and using the language of slavery. Here's a, an astonishing to me quotation from the essay when he's uh, making the case for conscription, mandatory draft, and so on. Quote, we should all feel some degree of its imperative if we were conscious of our work as an obligatory service to the state. We should be owned and I'm emphasizing that, the emphasis is in the original, we should be owned as soldiers are by the army and our pride would rise accordingly. We could be poor then without humiliation as army officers now are, unquote. Now note that this is one generation after the U.S. Civil War. This is 40 years after the end of slavery, and we have an American who is very comfortable with slavery, not just comfortable with slavery, but calling for a kind of ownership of human beings and slavery as a moral ideal. And this is an American philosopher, and frankly, I find that morally repulsive. Also, there's a kind of disingenuousness in William James. At one point, I think he recognizes that he's getting pretty over the top with all of this ownership and slavery, an obligatory slavery a service to the state business. He's starting to sound like a Hegelian. And at one point, he goes along and says, you know, the young people, yes, we're going to conscript them, we're going to draft them, we're going to make them work for the government for a few years and all kinds of pro uh, projects. But then uh, he throws in and says, well, we'll, you know, we'll give them uh, their, their choice of, of jobs uh, when, they're, when they're working for the state. And then he goes on to list the kind of jobs. 
to coal and iron mines, right, to freight trains, to fishing fleets in December, to dishwashing, clothes washing, and window washing, to road building and tunnel making, to foundries and stoke holes, and to the frames of skyscrapers, unquote. Yeah, okay, so we're going to give uh, individuals a choice. Now, I think this is a fig leaf, entirely disingenuous. Now, if you think of that list of jobs, which ones are going to be chosen first? Well, of course, everybody's going to want to work in the North Atlantic fishing fleets in December. Everybody's going to want to wash uh, other people's dirty socks and underwear. You know, but once all of the good jobs are chosen, what's left over? Who's going to do the, the other list of jobs there? And what are we going to say to those who don't get their first, second, or third choice? When we know that this is a government-run program, government bureaucrats, what are they going to say to the young people who don't get their quote-unquote choice? And what they're going to say is, you have to do something. It's the law. You are owned by us now. And here's what's available. And if you don't like it, tough. Uh, as we say on the farm, choice, my ass, William James. Finally, uh, partly an Americanized point as well, but again, we have an American philosopher not too long after, uh, you know, rather early still in American history. And the United States is at least officially supposed to be the nation of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And what we seem to have in uh, William James is an, uh, a philosopher who is uh, from a very alien philosophical tradition to all of that. Pursuit of happiness, uh, no. Yeah, you're window washing, kid. Yeah, you are going into the coal mines for a few years. Liberty, no, this is not a choice. This is mandatory conscription the government is making. Uh, your life is your own, the right to life, no, I'm afraid not. Your life belongs to us, this is ownership. So to the extent that America stands for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, William James is an explicit assault on all three of those principles. So in conclusion, uh, let me just say, uh, uh, you know, this is a very strong contrast to the United States' reputation as breeding uh, intellectuals who are in favor of the American aspiration for freedom of all individuals. And James's essay, to me, strikes a very strong highlighting that socialism really is the opposite, right? It's, it's about collectivism. It's very strongly about sacrifice for others. Uh, no compulsion about the use of government force, no qualms about the closeness of his program to slavery. He looks at history and he sees, yeah, sure, for a long time some people have been enslaved to a few, but his only alternative seems to be that all of us should be enslaved to all of us with the government running the whole show. The only real alternative uh, seems to be unavailable to him in which no one is enslaved to anybody that we have liberty rights for every individual. William James, with his explicit call for collectivism, compulsion, and government management of perhaps the most important results that any resource any of us have, our time, particularly when we are young people, repulsive. Mm -hmm.